in my opinion, counts. The Sasquatch legend, or the Sasquatch as such, will never go away. Even if it doesn't exist in the flesh, it is here as part and parcel of the North American or the world culture now. No one's ever caught one. No one's come close to catching one. There's never been a dead body recovered, not even a set of bones. And this is the only photo of one. That's if you don't subscribe to the popular theory that it's a man in a gorilla suit. But in the minds of avid Bigfooters, the Sasquatch is alive and well. And this is evidence. It's the Patterson photo, taken in 1967, supposedly of a female Bigfoot. Blurred, just enough for effect. Our search brought us to Vancouver, Canada, to the man who's been hunting Bigfoot longer than anyone else. René Dahinden is readying his houseboat for another stint in the wild. And because it is human-like, insofar as structure goes, physical structure, it would be mind-boggling. You know, it's okay finding a Loch Ness monster or other mystery type of creature. Fine, interesting. But this thing, because it's human-looking, that would be the key. But we needed facts. Next stop, Portland, Oregon. An unassuming bookstore used as a front for the ever-increasing Western Bigfoot Society. Tonight we have several interesting speakers, but first I want to mention that we've had a very recent sighting down in Klamath County. A sighting, and of a female no less. The female creature was a female with very large, naked breasts, Apparently it had a young nearby, but that wasn't uh, seen by the witnesses. Ah, so near and yet so far. But retired Deputy Sheriff Fred Bradshaw had even better news for the meeting, a personal encounter. When we saw the creature, it was standing with its face hidden. Uh, I estimated at the thing of being eight feet in height, uh, estimated weight between six and eight hundred pounds. The basement of the bookstore had everything all of the sightings well documented, from the nuptials to the firstborn. Apparently, Portland is a Bigfoot hotspot. Now, right, is this the sort of place where you'd find a Sasquatch? Well, right in this very area, we've had several reported sightings of the creatures. According to Ray, they're out there. Not just one, but big feet by the thousand. A gene pool big enough to sustain the species. A species so sophisticated, it communicates with man using percussion. By, here, let me get a stick here. One of the things we found by trial and error is that the things, sometimes if you make a noise in the woods, they'll respond. So I would beat a log. Three, two, three, and I'd quit. And as often as not, Way in the deep woods, you'll hear the same thing, sound come back again. And uh, I've had this happen before. I've mentioned it to other people, and they've had the same experience. So we think these things actually are communicating with us. Our walk through the woods took us across some fresh bear droppings, which begged the question... We know, obviously, what bears do in the woods. Do big feet do this in the woods as well? I think big feet do it in the woods also. We have several specimens that people have sent in. And what sets them apart is their un unusually large size. Of course. And there we left Ray Crow to contemplate his last answer while we continued the search for some facts. This is the Mount Hood region of Oregon, home of the Bigfoot Research Project. The locals around here say this is Bigfoot country. 
So we're going bush to try and find out. Our guide was 69-year-old Irishman Peter Byrne. Our plan, to spend the night under a full moon in the hope of finding a Bigfoot. Byrne is being bankrolled by the tens of thousands and he says they're closing in. Money buys equipment, it buys technology, it buys time. That's what we have now. And actually, all the years that I've been involved with it, a lot of it was very amateur at um, searching and researching on my part. This is different, this is professional. I think we have a good chance now of, um, of finding one. Do you believe that there could be a Bigfoot out there now, watching, listening to what we're doing? Well, we just heard a coyote call. And is there something out there? There could be a Bigfoot 50 feet from here, sitting, listening to us right now. And with that in mind, we sat and waited. How close have you come, do you think, to a Bigfoot? Well, I've heard one call at night, at two in the morning, once and that was half a mile away. I think I could best describe it as a screaming roar. A sound we didn't hear at all this time. Well, it's a little after 7 a.m. and we've survived the night, but no Bigfoot. There were a few strange noises though, a coyote and an owl. And as it turned out, one other unwelcome visitor. And that's a, an adult mountain lion also known as a panther or a cougar in this country. How old would that print be? Well, the dew is in it, so it was made early in the night, so it's probably five or six hours old going in that direction. <laughs> Should we be going in that direction? I'm, I'm inclined to go in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty harmless. So one little foot, but still no big foot. And that's where we left Peter Byrne, as we continued our search back across the waters to Canada, to the city of Victoria, where there'd been a sighting. But this Sasquatch wasn't going anywhere. It was still stuck firmly in North American Indian mythology. Very likely where it's always been. In this age of computer databases, space travel and diminishing frontiers, many find it hard to believe that some things may exist without humans knowing about them. But some believe in the unknown and seek it out no matter what the consequences. Tonight, we look at a Northwest legend that goes back farther than just about any other. Northwest Reports associate producer Sven Harhoff found out that even some people with academic credentials have become Bigfoot believers. Legends of Bigfoot have been around the Northwest more than a hundred years. The Indians who lived here before Lewis and Clark made carvings of creatures that some say represent the earliest sightings of Sasquatch. And we have one very exciting uh, sighting from this year. You might walk over one of these open fields here. Modern day investigators want to find a Bigfoot for varied reasons. I have not seen one, at least not to my knowledge. I've um, heard one. At least I'm pretty sure uh, that's what it was. <coughs> and um, once I uh, uh, smelled what uh, was probably a Sasquatch. Washington State University anthropology professor Grover Krantz has been recognized as an authority on evidence of Bigfoot. But he knows the academic world needs more than footprints and film. They need proof, they need tangible evidence, a skull on the table. Short of that, it doesn't exist. And that's, that's absolute. Krantz tells Northwest Reports he sees a clear way to prove Bigfoot's existence. Go out and shoot one. I think that's wrong. I think it's very wrong. In fact, I think it's criminal, just about. Peter Byrne, a big game hunter turned naturalist, looks for Bigfoot with little more than a camera. He says his research project is a benign operation. I think it's very wrong to say shoot one to prove that it's there. And uh, we're very much against that. Byrne runs what he calls the Bigfoot Research Project out of a house in Parkdale, Oregon, on the road to Mount Hood. We're fairly uh, satisfied that the, the things are there, 
And uh, basically what we're doing um, in a nutshell is, is um, gathering all of the information and putting it into a computer against a prepared database and looking for patterns. And then when we find these patterns, uh, we will apply uh, technical equipment in, in various forms. The five-year project got funding from a Massachusetts-based scientific group. The present project is a year old. We started in August of last year. Yeah, I've been in and out since 1960, which is 33 years, um, not on a full-time basis. I did 10 years in the 70s, from 1970 to 1979, and that was full-time. Um, but since then, I've been in and out of it, um, giving it what time I can. Um, in the search. In the 50s, Byrne joined organized searches for Yeti, or the Abominable Snowman, in Asia's Himalaya Mountains. The sponsors of those expeditions asked Byrne if he would help find a similar creature in the United States. And I have to admit, I laughed at the time. I thought it was very amusing that something like this, like an Abominable Snowman, could exist in the United States. So I came over in 1960 and spent a year and um, got bitten by the bug, if you like. Byrne searched without success. After a year, he left the country, but returned shortly thereafter to make Oregon the headquarters for his Bigfoot search. Well, tell me about this bug. What is it that, uh, that fuels the fire that, that leads to all these projects? I think it's the challenge of, of, in this particular um, respect of, of the unknown. Um, and um, the possibility that um, if these things are truly there, that we're looking at um, something that's uh, shall we say, uh, almost still living in, in the primordial world. Um, we think these things are, are, are human in form, a hominid form. We don't think they're animals. Fact of the matter is, this is not an animal that's somewhere between ape and human. It is flat out ape. An older man with his dog were out here, and they encountered one. Krantz developed his Bigfoot interest during his teenage years. When I became a professional anthropologist, I realized that if this thing is real, it's very important in my field. Even if it isn't real, it's indirectly important because it's a, um, a piece of folklore that's really weird. So I felt that I couldn't honestly just ignore it. I had to find out for sure, one way or the other. So I looked into it, and to my satisfaction, I did find out for sure. Krantz says the most compelling evidence supporting the existence of Bigfoot are footprints. Hundreds of footprints found all over the region. Many of them are faked. But not all, says Krantz. So if even one of those wasn't faked. Yeah. You don't need half, you don't need 1%, you just need one. Which meaning? One real one. And then you know that the species is real. And what's the likelihood of at least one of these being real? Guaranteed. So Krantz is convinced. He even suggests Sasquatches may be an endangered species and that they may need our help. But you can't help what you can't find. Bigfoot believers have yet to convince the scientific community or the public, and they know that the only way to stop the ridicule they face is to produce indisputable evidence. And I've stuck my neck out very flatly on this, that the only way you're going to prove it exists is to bring in a body or a piece of a body. You don't have to ask me, ask any scientist, any skeptic, uh, and they'll tell you the same thing. They need proof, they need tangible evidence. Krantz says the most likely way to find a dead Sasquatch is to kill one. If somebody goes out and shoots one, brings in the body or a substantial part of it, then the, p the party's over, it's done, it's proven, <coughs> and the scientific world will have to acknowledge it. Would you like to capture one? No, we're against the idea of capture. So you'd like to track? I mean, you'd like to find or? We'd like to find one, confront one, if you like, and see if it's possible to communicate. So you'd like to give Peter Byrne a gun instead of a camera? Yes. Peter Byrne and his camera is never going to prove them. He may make himself uh, a nice name if he gets some uh, good film of it, but he's never going to prove it to the skeptics. The skeptics will look at everything he gets, the best he can possibly get, and they will say, fake. They've said that to Patterson's film, they'll say it to Peter Byrne. <coughs> There's no way you can prove it with anything but a body. On October 20th, 1967, Yakima, Washington resident Roger Patterson and his buddy Robert Gimlin reportedly encountered a Sasquatch while hunting for Sasquatch evidence. Second only to the footprints, I would class the Patterson film as the, the most powerful evidence. The two men were on horseback in Northern California when they discovered this creature crouching beside a creek. Their presence alarmed the creature, which allegedly stood up and walked away. The sighting spooked Patterson's horse, which reared and fell over backward on top of him. About 20 seconds lapsed before Patterson grabbed his 16-millimeter camera and started filming. 
Patterson kept rolling until he ran out of film. According to Krantz, the encounter was over in less than two minutes, and Patterson shot 952 color frames of what many say is a real Sasquatch. Krantz analyzed the film frame by frame. He reports no evidence of fakery, though he says he believes Patterson may have faked the film if he had the opportunity to do so. Krantz says no one has ever bothered to disprove the film. Analyzing the creature in the film uh, as to the idea that, well, it's just a big man in a fur suit. There is no man that can be fitted into a, a suit that gives those body proportions. The only way you could put a man in a suit is get a man six and a half feet tall, walk, walk in a slouch, but break his arm right about in the middle of the upper arm so that you give him a fake shoulder there. And I don't think anyone would have done that. Though no one has captured a decent image of a Bigfoot on film or tape since Patterson, reports of sightings and fresh footprints continue to reach Bigfoot-seeking organizations. Many of the sightings occur at night. Something on the side of a road caught briefly in the headlights of a passing car. Fewer sightings take place in the dense northwest forests. About 56, I guess, it was working up the Oakley Canyon and Walden. Furman Osborne says he saw a huge hairy creature up close and personal one sunny morning. Osborne was working as a logger in Oregon's Hood River National Forest. He and his colleagues were taking a break in the shade one day when a Bigfoot-like creature allegedly appeared. Here come this big thing out of the brush, stuck up through that. It looked to be about seven feet tall, a big, tall, long, hairy legs, and it stood up right, but it had a real big, broad shoulder drooped over like, you know, a monster. It looked sort of like a man, it looked like a beast. And, and it was a big thing, it, you know, I'd say it's six, seven feet tall. And it weighed several hundred pounds. You know. Osborne followed the creature to get a better look. He says it quickly headed toward thick scrub. He didn't run, he just walked real fast, took big long strides. And Osborne says he threw some rocks at it in hopes of getting it to turn and show its face. It did not, and that was the last time Osborne ever saw such a creature. So you do believe that there, there are creatures out there? Yeah, well, I know there are creatures of some kind because I saw it and I was close to it, but what it was, I'll never know about. Perhaps none of us will ever know for sure if Sasquatch-like creatures exist. For some, it might be the search for the unknown that makes the Bigfoot mystery so intriguing. But not so for Krantz. He wants the hunt to end, and end fast. My reputation in straight science has suffered very badly for this. And I would feel very vindicated if the search has ended successfully. As for Peter Byrne, he still has four years of funding for his search. He can't say what he'll do after that, though he gives no indication he'll give up the search. So you never tire? I mean, you don't get up in the morning someday and say, this is the last thing that I want to do. It's, it's no, I get up in the morning and say, this is the day I may find Bigfoot. Sven tells me that at least a couple of Bigfoot sightings have happened in the last couple of months. Two loggers saw a Sasquatch in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest on September 13th. His exact location has been held back to stop anyone who wants to go out and shoot one. Four hikers made a second sighting early last month near Sacramento. We'll certainly keep you up to date on Bigfoot sightings we hear about. Northwest Reports continues in just a moment. Two weeks ago on Bigfoot, Larry Lund of Vancouver writes, 
As a Bigfoot investigator, I have been mostly disappointed by the way all branches of the media handle the subject. If they are not looking down their collective noses at the believers, they present the subject in a tongue-in-cheek manner and give the public the impression that we all border on lunacy. Your show handled the subject with fairness and did nothing to offend the intelligence of the people who believe in the possibility of its existence.